Yeah, there you are. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Uro Zafolshnik. I'm a registered nurse, you already heard, and I have a master's degree from social work. I head of SIM Center, that is the part of Primary Healthcare Research and Development Institute. I work in CHC Ljubljana, and today we will introduce uh, you to CHC Ljubljana in the best positive way. Uh, and let me introduce myself. My name is Davorin Markovic. I'm a coordinator in Sim Center Ljubljana. I also work as an instructor in the Simulation Center. Uh, we are uh, basically the part of Primary Healthcare Research and Development Institute, and we will show you today how we work in CHC Ljubljana, especially in these times. I would like to ask you so uh, to see this movie, and I hope you will enjoy in it. The Community Health Center Ljubljana was established by ordinance of the municipality of the city of Ljubljana on the 22nd of November 1967. On the 1st of January 1968, 25 independent primary health care institutions from the Ljubljana region and the municipality of Rusuglje united under one roof, the Community Health Center Ljubljana. Nevertheless, primary health care in Ljubljana dates as far back as 1932, when the health center of Queen Maria was established in Trinity. Today, the community health center Ljubljana is the biggest public health care institution at the primary level of health care in Slovenia. It comprises eight organizational units, Vizigrad, Center, Mostekulje, Šiška, Vičunik, Šedvid, Clinic for General Emergency Medical Aid and the Institute of Research and Development of Primary Healthcare at 16 different locations. Our healthcare services are also provided in some remote locations, namely general medicine clinics in retirement homes and dental clinics for children and youth at primary schools in Ljubljana. Altogether, we have over 2.5 million patient visits per year. In 2014, we established the first simulation center at the primary level of healthcare, where we run advanced simulations in healthcare on the state of the art equipment and thus educate professional and non professional society. Okay, this was our introductional video for the simulation center. And now let me tell you something about simulation center Ljubljana. Basically, why do we need simulation center in primary healthcare? Do we really need it? Well, we think that we need it and we, so we have to build it. And we built it already. In one year, we have over two and a half million visitors in CHC Ljubljana and only around 100 reports of emergency situations. What does that mean? That if we do not uh, uh, train enough, if you are not prepared, we cannot arrange those situations when needed to. So, in primary, primary health care, we have different types of patients. Basically, they are daily patients and vitally endangered patients. And this is why we have established the first simulation center in primary health care in Slovenia. Uh, basically, who do we train here? Of course, doctors nurses, healthcare teams, first responders. These are usually people with high risk jobs, like firemen, police officers, uh, people working in education, and of course, lay population. Why is that important? Because everyone can help in the, uh, when something happens, and it's very important that people know how to help one and, one and other. Uh, how does our work look like? Basically, we have guidelines which are important, but of course, skills are another session that have to be taken into account, and they're really, really important. Uh, be beyond skills, we have, of course, simulations that are very realistic, and here we can also use augmented reality that you will learn about a little bit later. Feedback is another thing that is important and that we use, and of course, in situ simulation that is done in the uh, institute that is demanded to be done. 
what do we do? We first give our employees guidelines so they can prepare at home. Uh, and what do we do with this? We minimize theoretical hours when they come to us so we can train more, so we can train more skills and do more simulations. Then they come to train in Sim Center, and about six months after that, we organize them in situ simulations so that we can see how do they really know to do things in real life. So, what is in situ simulation? It is a simulation in real clinical environment at their workplace and using their medical equipment. Why is that important? Well, because we want to ensure work quality, find security risks, and see how they respond in real emergency situations. Uh, when we are doing evaluation and debriefing, these are the things that come to our mind. The first one is safety, algorithm, safe defibrillation, team leadership, communication, and of course, control of the equipment that is being used. Uh, simulation, of course, is an excellent way for healthcare workers to train their skills, in, and of course, in a safe environment. This is an example of our patient that we use so we can train. He is not a real patient, but he is uh, basically a dummy, but a real life dummy. This is another example that we can use so it can be as real as possible. These are just few of our tools that we have so we can work. Uh, we want them to experience simulation in how to approach acute situation so they can later better manage real life acute situations. Why? Well, we have to ensure patient safety. This is our primary care. Uh, and something about our results. We have almost 2,000 participants that rated us, and a lot of um, results were very good. They were beyond 94%, and evaluation helped us so we can be better and we can adapt to different situations. This is a chart of average knowledge and the average output knowledge, and as you can see, the average output knowledge is very good if you compare it to the intake knowledge that was done in our attendees. In situ results, very important. Average response time to the state of emergency was about 40 seconds, and we want our teams to come to help in about 120 seconds. So 40 seconds is really fast, so help can come. So they can relieve the teams that are doing the basic CPR or basically whatever. Red alarm is something that we are very proud of and in, that ensures our patients that they are safe in our environment. This is basically the activation of emergency duty teams for adult and pediatric patients all over CHC Ljubljana and its units. What is their job? Well, to act quickly and efficiently in case of urgent situations. Of course, again, average response time 40 seconds and we want them to come in two minutes. So we are very proud of that. So the help can come quickly. These are the posters that are uh, printed all over CHC Ljubljana, so everyone knows who, when to call and where to call. Uh, in five years, we have trained over 10,000 people, and their intake and outtake knowledge was, of course, measured. Average intake knowledge was about 45%, and average outtake knowledge was around 80%. So this is really good because it's almost 50% up and this is great when doing with healthcare teams. Why again preparing for emergency situations? To ensure patient safety. This is why we do everything that we do. To upgrade this concept, we have developed a simulation mobile training unit. This is an 18 meter trailer which can be used for educations, for simulations and of course as an educational room. These are pictures of it. It can be used everywhere in Slovenia and, of course, in Europe. So it's very important to have it, and we are only few of us that have it in Europe. Uh, this, again, is another picture of it. This is the inside. We have two compartments. This is the simulation compartment, where we can do our uh, simulations, training, and everything. And this is one example of the training that we do. Uh, why basically sim mobile? Well, we all know that there is time shortage in healthcare teams in the world, 
lack of modern and realistic equipment, high education costs, lack of knowledge, and we could uh, talk more about this. All these factors are very important, so the SIM Mobile was born, and it was a great solution, as we saw. What are the advantages of using SIM Mobile? Well, the first one, of course, access to learning with simulations that cannot be uh, accessed everywhere around the world. For example, in Slovenia, we have it in Ljubljana, and, and if you want to go to Lendava, it can be a problem for them to come to us, so we can go to them. Of course, this is education cost reduction. We go on their location, saving their time and, music, and using very highly realistic simulators. Uh, when talking about high level of realism, we have two uh, different spheres. Of course, we have plastic dummies and we have realistic simulators. Plastic dummies are also okay for skills, but not for simulations. For simulations, you have to activate real feelings and it's important that it is as real as possible. We don't want plastic for simulations, with, for skills, yeah, but not for simulation. Again, one female uh, dummy that can be used, and of course, our little baby Eero. This is one example of trauma simulation, and let's see how it looks like. <laughs> Uh, when we are doing this, it has to be as real as possible, so people can, people can really relate to this. And this was an example of a great simulation that was done by the EMS team. Another picture of our patient Hans, who had a really bad day. Uh, with SIM Mobile, we are making learning with simulations available to all healthcare teams in Slovenia and, of course, beyond. Until now, we were on five congresses, three international congresses, and one congress abroad. So we are very proud of that, and I hope there will be more to come. We did almost 10,000 kilometers in one year, so this is a big step for us, and of course for Slovenia, for simulation improvement. Have a safe journey. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's start with the chat box. Uh, the first question is, is it publicity, is it public city finance and free to join? Uh, this is uh, funded, of course, by our mayor. He is our, uh, basically our boss. And it's not free to join because we train lay population and we also train professionals. Of course, we do some uh, interventions and education for free and those are that are on a high scale and are important for the country for example kindergarten maybe schools but basically because we are professionals yeah it has to be funded in some kind of way and basically our mayor is our main funder uh, number two question are there tailored modules depending the participants uh, firefighters, public at large, nurses, and so on. Uh, yes, we have more than 50 modules that we do, and they are basically tailored to every kind of population that you want. If, the, if these are the firemen, they are tailored to their uh, pre-knowledge. If these are doctors, of course, to their pre-knowledge. If they are pediatricians, we have to ensure that we teach them things that they need as pediatricians, not as firemen, because they will probably not have it trauma in their work. Uh, number three question, is there a business model behind the SIM center? Uh, this is maybe a question that my friend uh, and boss Urash can help me with. Um, there is a business model, but because we are a healthcare funded, we cannot uh, put ourselves out there like a private firm. Uh, so there is some kind of model, but it's basically that models are done for this part that we are funded by us so what it means when we train people this fund goes so we can create new content we do not make profit with it if that the question was meant of, of course we have a serious business model uh, but for us it's really important that we have zero 
uh, when we talk about finance, uh, but uh, we, um, so of course, we have a serious business model. If uh, if uh, someone interesting uh, made the same model, just ask us. And uh, for example, people from Croatia is already ask us, and we teach them how to start with the same model. Okay, great. Thank you, Urash. Uh, fourth question: Do you also do training on communication in emergency situations? Yes. Uh, we will have a lecture on from our uh, uh, mediation center where communication is very important so we will hear all about that later uh, number five do you have a community network to support this surface basically in slovenia we do not have nobody to talk to so we are we are connected to sesam and this is a european and world community so in Slovenia, no, but in the world, in Europe, yes. And of course, in AXSL, when we talk about uh, the world community. Number six, are you thinking of extending this to other types of community health care? Uh -huh, for example, like mental health. Uh, for now, we, are, we, are, we have a lot of uh, things on our mind. Of course, maybe we'll go into that sphere but um, it will be more of a social work uh, thing that we are doing right now but maybe someday yes i think these were the questions for this part so now if there are no questions in the chat box we can go on with our proceedings now you will see a documentary presentation of CHC Ljubljana and the COVID-19 movie Enjoy. With its 16 locations, the Ljubljana Community Health Center is Slovenia's biggest public health institution, providing primary health care to the population of the capital Ljubljana and beyond. We provide care to close to half a million of registered patients, contributing to more than 2.8 million visits a year. At the entrances to community health centers, triage areas were established already in February. Here, healthcare professionals direct patients and make sure there are appropriate numbers of service users who can be in the unit at the same time. Despite this, patient zero emerged on March 4, 2020. Regardless of all the procedures, he managed to enter the waiting room area, and it was found later that he tested positive for the new coronavirus. Kaj vse si ti naredil takrat, ko si pristopil na pacienta, si spohnil masko, si si razkužil roke, koliko ljudi je bilo takrat v tisti čakalnici, koliko zaposlenih je bilo zaradi tega izpostavljenih, pač en cilj, koliko skrbi se bolj sporošil. With the outbreak of COVID-19 in Slovenia, we had to address a comprehensive reorganization of our existing operations. Even before the first case was reported, Slovenia monitored the situation in China and in the neighboring Italy. We tested in practice our contingency plan for infectious disease pandemics. As the infection spread in our immediate neighborhood, we immediately set up the crisis headquarters consisting of the extended management, representatives from infection control related to healthcare, a nurse representative and PR services, which meets at least twice a week. When organizing work during the epidemic, it is crucial from a professional point of view to ensure rational use of personal protective equipment, rational allocation of human resources, good provision of information to employees in terms of rapid transmission of information, coordinated action of department heads with management and clear management guidance to keep employees and patients feel safe despite the uncertainty of the situation during the epidemic. The professional management of the institution and of the crisis headquarters translate into working 24-7. It means that one is devoid of one's own wishes and lacks leisure time. Also, one cannot devote time to all the little details, making treatment easier for patients and employees. The permanent teams of coordinators were appointed. They are tasked with work organization by areas. It is essential that the team is permanent and a 24-hour call center was set up as well. 
The call center was designed to raise awareness about proper preventive measures and to ensure continuous availability for the population in case they have doubts or questions. Appropriate personal protective equipment provides a basis for the safe work of our employees. Making sure that enough personal safety equipment is available during times of epidemic is a very big challenge. The Commission for Prevention and Control of Healthcare Associated Infections focused its activities on the immediate education of employees, the provision of personal protective equipment, isolation facilities, and the preparation of entry points for testing and supporting documents such as working instructions and reminders. At the level of Slovenia, taking swabs for the new coronavirus is concentrated to 16 entry points. The entry point of the Ljubljana Community Health Center, as the biggest entry point, covers almost one quarter of the population in the country. Patients cannot come to the entry point for taking swabs unannounced, but are referred there by their general practitioner or the on-call doctor following telephone triage. The so-called drive-in system was introduced so as to accelerate taking swab samples, thereby greatly improving patient flows and the number of swabs taken. Work at entry point has been perfectly organized from the very start. High level of personal protective equipment is being provided. Working in all weather conditions is a particular challenge. However, due to team's great dedication, work runs smoothly through all the day. Our units were separated into infectious and non-infectious part. Patients at risk who do not have COVID-19 suspected symptoms are scheduled for an appointment taking place in the centralized clinic for non-infectious patients. We have pediatrics offices for well-child visits with separate entrance so that infected children don't mix with the healthy ones. A day before examination, the nurse calls the patients and checks if everyone at home is healthy. The child is scheduled for an appointment accompanied by only one parent, provided that all family members are healthy. The work is organized in such a way that the patients do not meet while the rooms are duly cleaned and ventilated. A patient who believes that he, she has to be examined first calls the clinic of his or her GP. If the doctor, after conducting telephone triage, estimates that the examination is needed, the patient gets an appointment. Upon entering the community health center, the patient receives a surgical mask in the triage area and disinfects hands. The persons without the appointment cannot enter the community health center. Healthcare professionals have a demanding task in this period. Most treatments are delivered with telemedicine. Patients send the photos of medical condition symptoms and via the phone present medical history and measurements. Phone replies do not allow for touching and seeing the patients, who often express through body language what cannot be uttered in words. Hence, the doctor always doubts if the right decision was made. Professional judgment is much more difficult under these circumstances. We want to protect healthy patients from being infected with new coronavirus. That is why we choose long distance treatment as often as possible even if it means prescribing antibiotic without clinical examination. We needed another strategy. We needed to organize common COVID unit, which first started operating on 16th of March. Doing this, we had two goals in mind. We wanted to make sure that infective patients don't mix with healthy ones, and we wanted to optimize the use of personal protective equipment. We set up the entry point for the examination and treatment of patients with suspected coronavirus for the patients coming from the central Slovenia region, which in total means 575,400 patients from the Ljubljana Community Health Center and seven other community health centers, as well as all concession holders in these regions. The COVID screening clinic separately treats adults and children. This clinic is not designed for examinations of all acutely ill patients, but only for those where the GP estimated that monitoring via the phone was no longer safe. Patients receive a scheduled appointment over the phone. Once they are in front of the clinic, they ring the bell at the entrance and wait for the nurse to open. At the entrance of the community health center, they receive a mask, then enter the clinic and give the health insurance card to the nurse. 
Upon the examination in the COVID clinic, the physician determined the patient's clinical condition runs different investigations and laboratory diagnostics. If blood collection is required, it is performed by an adequately protected lab worker. Following the examination of the patient, the physician estimates whether referral to a hospital is needed or if the patient can stay at home and telemedicine is performed. The work organization protocol has been drafted for activities in the COVID clinic. Employees also follow instructions with regard to dressing and undressing of personal protective equipment. After working in the COVID screening clinic, it is very difficult to go home to one's family, young children, grandparents, while knowing that there is at least a theoretical chance we could be infected. As for general continuous emergency medical care in the Ljubljana Community Health Center, we immediately started adapting our work organization to the epidemiological situation, both at the emergency unit as well as in the field. A swab is taken from all the patients with suspected COVID-19 before entering the emergency unit. We also had to adapt the provision of emergency medical care in the field. The emergency medicine team puts on personal protective equipment already before entering the ambulance or before departing for intervention. For the time of the epidemic, an additional team has been set up at the General Emergency Department, CHC Ljubljana, dedicated to home visits of immobile patients suspected or confirmed COVID infection. The healthcare professional team examines such a patient and provides them healthcare at their home. House calls are centralized for all patients in need of such care. If necessary, when examining the patient at home, a swab is taken as well. The majority of patients stay in home care. In the case of a relevant indication, such as, for example, a chronic wound, decubitus, patients at home are visited by community nurses who enter people's homes in the period when social contacts are prohibited. Hence, the patients at home are even more vulnerable and exposed. Particular attention should be paid to the most vulnerable population in social security institutions. Several doctor's offices of the Community Healthcare Center Ljubljana are operating within the time of homes. The first cases of COVID also appeared in the time of home This is where we organized the Department for COVID Positive Residents. In case of the infection, care recipients are divided into three separate zones. Infectious, a gray zone occupied by residents with suspected COVID-19 and non-infectious. Due to the shortage of healthcare professionals following COVID-19 infection, teams from the hospital level have also been involved in the care of COVID-19 residents. An individual treatment plan is prepared for every care recipient. We centralized all the activities reduced the number of direct contacts with patients, separated and centralized the treatment of infectious and non-infectious patients in need of a medical examination. In this way, the spread of the infectious disease, both among the general population as well as among healthcare professionals, is limited to the maximum. In our premises, the entry point for emergency dental medical treatment of the wider Ljubljana region which is one of seven at the national level and covers the largest share of the population, came into operation. Patients are scheduled for an appointment by their chosen dentist following telephone triage via the call center. Clinics have been refurbished according to work needs and a highly infectious environment. Throughout the work process, the areas are protected by way of compresses. All the instruments are individually packed and sterilized. All devices and instruments, which are not absolutely necessary, were removed from clinics. The organization of an entry point is a living system which requires constant adaptation to the needs of patients, healthcare professionals, as well as equipment. For this reason, we decided for the organizers to be present at all times. During difficult and demanding times, such as this epidemic, appropriate attention has to be devoted to the employees when they encounter fear, helplessness, and different circumstances. It is therefore important that our associates are equipped with relevant skills and tools. Radovi pa starše videla, ki jih nisem videla že cel mesec, ki oba dva sta starejša, sta bolna, nikaj ne potrebujem morja, potrebujem ljudi. 
do katerih ne morem zdaj. Čakaš, da boš ali zbolel? Pač nekako tist strah te skos malo gnjavi. Moja mami ni v redu in imam en tako občutek, da občute krivde, da bi ni tam zrave. Vsekakor bi ste se ali ušli od mojo. The primary healthcare research and development institute within the simulation center organized training by means of simulations in relation to the correct taking of swab samples, efficient communication during the epidemiological situation with users and employees, and the demonstration of correct use of protective equipment. The changed operation of primary healthcare impacts the provision of care to patients and the well-being of healthcare professionals. Education using simulations in healthcare is very important, especially when talking about intervention that we do not do every day. And we don't have epidemic every day, we don't take swaps every day, and we don't have crisis communication every day. These are interventions that simulations in healthcare make sure we stay competent in and it makes our practice more safe. We monitor our services, record our own actions and track the data that will help us analyze what could be done in a different and better way in similar situations in the future. We plan to examine the views of professionals with regard to changes in work organization and the operation of family medicine outpatient clinics. We are going to compare the situation before, during, and after the epidemic, elaborate the model of future measures, exchange the results, and also compare them internationally. Research provides insight into a change functioning of primary health care during the epidemic. This enables us to design a model that provides quality patient care in similar situations in the future. Good cooperation with the local community is of the utmost importance in the current situation. Hence, our sincere gratitude goes to all the people as they recognize the seriousness of the epidemiological situation. They cooperate with us and in the process demonstrate different forms of help to make our work easier. In tackling the demanding epidemiological situation, we have been greatly assisted by the civil protection of the City Municipality of Ljubljana. The City Municipality of Ljubljana facilitates our work process by providing us additional space and arranging free parking in the vicinity of the Community Health Center, thereby improving the availability of health care and the treatment at the entry point. Only collaboration is the key to success, and we have succeeded. We need the humane to refuse we look back to the future. Surely, a similar story awaits us, and then it will be easier. The epidemiological situation demanded new organizational measures and many adjustments, and at the same time, it brought us closer together. Running such an institution is being constantly available to all employees, reporters, and decision makers. This brings changes to our daily routines, changes to our lives. But from the complexity of this situation, one must take out those elements which can ease our work for the future. Okay, this was the movie. Thank you for all your interesting questions. Uh, and we will start with the first one. Do you have a contact tracing team for COVID-19 in this setup, or do you need support from other services within the national health system? We have our own uh, contact tracing teams that we use for COVID-19. For example, if there's an exposure or something to uh, infected patients, then of course they can track all the contacts and this can be done by our teams and of course there is also a national health system team that can help and this is the NAHAS. This is from the national health system and it can help us when doing uh, tracing those patients. Second question, do you use telemedicine consultations? Of course, uh, for all the primary healthcare doctors they use uh, telemedicine consultation, especially now. 
uh, when we have to watch out for possible COVID-19 uh, infections. So all the doctors in primary health care use telemedicine. Number three, do you have sufficient ventilators? How many hospital admissions are there in Slovenia this month? Uh, because we are in primary health care, I cannot give you the numbers for the uh, hospitals, but uh, for now we have enough ventilators. All of the patients that need ICU treatment are accepted into the ICU and of course ventilators are available. But because we are primary, primary health care, our job is to get them to the hospital if their admission is needed for them. Uh, next question. How are young people responding to the COVID-19 advice in Slovenia and how does the CHC design messages for young people? Uh, I think young people respond okay to all the messages from the country and of course from the national health systems. And of course CHC Ljubljana encourages, encourages them uh, to respect uh, those um, advices and of course uh, when the uh, sufficient people are in COVID contact or something like that, there's even more important that we use that advice and uh, respect it. Next question. How did you communicate about the rules and locations for testing? Uh, here in CHC Ljubljana we have a mobile drive-in for uh, lo uh, basically a mobile uh, COVID-19 tent. Uh, so people uh, go with their cars, like drive-in, like in McDonald's, for example. Uh, so it can be done in the most efficient and safe manner possible. Uh, this was done by our COVID-19 team and, of course, the leadership of CHC Ljubljana. So this was established close to the CHC main headquarters here in Metelkova. And it was arranged by them. And, of course, doing the drive-in system that uh, is going very good at the moment. Next question was, how do you work with schools and universities? Uh, as we are primary um, healthcare, we work with schools and universities in that way when talking about pediatrics, because we have preventive programs and curative programs for pediatricians, and they are uh, in contact with schools and universities, so they, of course, can work with them. Uh, how do you support the elderly who live in elderly homes? Uh, this is a great question. CHC Ljubljana has in every elderly home a special um, a doctor and a nurse who helps uh, to arrange those patients or elderly. So in every elderly home there is an ambulance and there is a doctor and a nurse working there every day so they can help with the situation in COVID-19. Another question is, was it necessary to train additional professionals and also for testing uh, centers? If so, how did you organize enough workforce and training? Yes, it was uh, necessary to train additional people because what we found out is that we don't have enough doctors, but we have sufficient number of nurses. So we trained additional nurses to help in COVID-19 situation and also to take swabs. Uh, so we had the necessary workforce, but all we had to do was do the educational thing, and this is what we did. Um, so for now we have enough uh, workforce, they were all educated, and I think we, the numbers will, we will see are later, but we also managed to educate uh, GPs, nurses, and of course, some pediatricians and uh, dentists. So the dentist healthcare also was taken into account here and they came here to help us. So that was a big relief. Okay, uh, next question. Collaboration proved to be essential to deliver an adequate uh, COVID care. Uh, did interprofessional collaboration have a specific role in this? Yes, it was, and as I was talking about it earlier, it was very important that we trained doctors and nurses alike. So not just doctors, not just nurses, but both, so we can all work together. Another question was, how do you experience remote care for people with limited health care? 
uh, limited skills to communicate or line or by phone. We, he we have our nurses that are on the field uh, and they go to those patients and they can be a missing link between the doctor and the community health center in Ljubljana. So they, come, they go onto the field and they can help the patients that need help on, on distance. Uh, in the beginning and now do you test all persons with complaints suggested of COVID-19? In the first part we did, but now we only test those that are the most possible that they could have COVID-19. So they are selected now and this is the job of GPs when they go in contact with with uh, people by telemedicine, by email, by phone or anything. And they can put them into our COVID drive-in. Uh, do you have any physiotherapy services to help your COVID-19 patients? Yes, we have. We have uh, on-duty psychologists that can, that can help with, um, with those um, treatments and everything. Uh, thank you for all the interesting questions for this part. Uh, and now, uh, we will talk about managing scenarios that you have seen in the movie and Uros will tell you something about this. To manage all the scenarios that you have seen in the movie, there is a certain number of skills that have to be mastered. Uh, one of the most important skills is how to properly use personal protective equipment. Personal pr protect, protective equipment is for us is really important and we will show you a video clip and we will ask you to find risk and mistakes that we that were done in it so risk and mistakes that were done in it write all the found mistakes and the risk in chat box okay if you find something please write in chat box Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so this was our uh, undressing of personal pr protective equipment. I hope you have found some errors because they were there. And I encourage you to uh, look them out and see what can be done better. For example, do we disinfect our hands when we have our gloves on? And do we, can we touch our personal protective suit without gloves? These are all the di dilemmas and you can find out them in your handbooks. So let's go on with it. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, another important skill is taking swabs for COVID-19. And in Cechicil, Ljubljana, we had a lot of trouble in the beginning of the pandemic. And of course, as I said before, we did not have enough doctors. So we also did a workshop for nurses and dental teams so they could help in the COVID situations. And now the, we have enough workforce that can be done with them. Uh, in this way, we had trained around 289 employees, and these were 47 dentists, 24 GPs, and around 118 nurses. Uh, now we will take a look at how to take swabs for COVID-19. We'll have a workshop, and you can see everything, how it can be done, and how we did it in CHC Ljubljana. Hello, darling. Can we start, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, we will start with the workshop for doing the taking swaps for the COVID-19. And of course, the first thing that we had to show our employees was what the, are the uh, documents needed, of course, the equipment and everything. So this is our uh, document for microbiological uh, specimens that we did. And these are the um, swabs that we can take to do this job right. Okay, what is very important when taking swabs, for now we have a patient that is in a uh, bed. But as we said before, we have a mobile taking center. It is basically a drive-in. And people come in their cars 
and we can uh, take swaps through the windshield. So it is very good. It's also safe for us and it's fast. We do that in one minute and they can go home and the exposure rate is very low for us. When we have a patient in, I don't know, ER or something like that, we have to take swabs, of course. And now we will see how we can do this. Uh, Yure, we have a patient here and we have, we have to take her swab. Okay. Another nurse did all the documentation and I, now I will show you how to do this. Of course, we all should have personal protective equipment. Okay. Uh, so the suit, the glasses and everything. No, we don't have this because uh, protective equipment is very scarce and uh, expensive. And of course, when doing that, that is an uh, initial workshop that is being done there. Okay. So we have our patient Vivian here, and I will show you how to take her swab. The first thing that we have to do is ask the patient uh, if uh, her breathing is fine, because the first thing that we want to take her swab is the nasopharynx. If that cannot be done, we have to take it from the larynx. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Yeah, of course. So we will ask her if her uh, no, nose ways are great. Uh, Ma'am, can you please tell me if you can breathe okay from both of your nostrils? Yes. Okay, she said that they are both fine, so there's no problem doing from one or the other nostril. If the patient has some problems with her septum, we cannot put this swab in because we can injure her, or if she has uh, some kind of bleeding problems, uh, taking drugs that uh, do not help in that way, we have to take all those accounts into that matter, okay? So she is ready. She is in a comfortable position. We have the mask on, but we will take it off so we can take the swab later. The documentation is all done and we are all in our protective personal equipment. The first thing that we would do, we would ask her if she can blow her nose, if, she's, if she has something in it, and then we can take the swab, okay? I will ask you if you can take, hold it. yeah, hold it for me. And I will take the patient her mask off, but not revealing her mouth because we have uh, exposure from uh, her airway. Okay, ma'am, I will give your mask a little bit off, and we will go through the okay. nose. Okay, into nasal five. It will be uncomfortable, but we have to do this. Okay. Okay. We will go now, and I I have to be uh, very uh, safe with it, so I take the longest possible route as possible. Okay. We'll go in and we have to go in it so we can touch the nasal pharynx. It's not enough for two centimeters. We have to go all the way in as it can go. When we touch the nasal pharynx, we take swab for around 10 seconds. And of course, we have to monitor the patient if she can uh, uh, do this. Okay. If not, of course, we take it out earlier. Okay, ma'am, just a few more seconds. Three, two, one. Great. Thank you. We put the mask on and we put this into the swab. Great. We document everything, of course, so the number and the patient uh, goes together. We thank her and, of course, go to another patient if necessary. If nasopharynx couldn't be done, we take the other route. And now we will also show you about the larynx. Okay. Basically, everything is the same. Documentation is the same, personal protective equipment. We take the mask off. She can cough if she needs to earlier, so she will not cough at us. And we do it now like this. Can I ask you to hold it again? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Yure. And she would say ah and put her tongue out, and we could use a little speculum or something to put it down. We go through there. Uh, okay, thank you. We don't do that for a long time because she can cough or she can be nauseous and can have problems on her airway okay thank you this is the part how we do workshop on swabs okay of course in personal uh, equipment and for uh, a lot of person vivian of course is our simulator it's not a real person so all of you won't think that we abuse vivian right now this is her job okay uh, so you i will ask you now if you can take the swab. okay yeah of course first we will take the nasal firings okay, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna just express yeah. because her nostrils are open. Okay. Yes. okay. I will take this. I will warn okay. her that it's a little bit annoying. So yeah, and I'm gonna go inside. Yeah, just go more, more. 
a little bit up. Yeah. No, up, up, up. Let me help you. Yeah, sure. Okay. You do it like <laughs> this, okay? Yeah. And you have to go all the way to the right. Okay? Do it for 10 seconds and turn it. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And cover it in. And what we have to watch out is when we take the swab, I take the necessary yeah, as yeah. long as you can yeah so we minimize the exposure rate okay. you're also going to try the lines okay, okay. great here is the swab okay. i will take the mask off so i can help you okay, okay. the longest say. possible route is possible okay, uh, 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 okay. okay. great right. just going to cover you again and put it inside okay okay and this is the basic thing how we manage to train uh, our employees of course in protective personal equipment using realistic simulators because it is not ethical that we can do this on the real person like doing simulation in healthcare we have to be ethical about it so we use uh, real life simulators and vivian's job was to train our gps nurses and dental teams and as we said before we train a lot of nurses, GPs, and dental teams that could help with the COVID-19 situation. Thank you. <clears throat> when we have a patient in entry point and he comes to Sehatsi Ljubljana because of COVID-19, he comes for two reasons. For taking COVID-19 swabs or he has medical condition, uh, his medical condition is uh, urgent, okay? So we can have a serious medical condition in primary health care, uh, so we must prepare. Uh, now we'll talk about, because of that, we'll talk about uh, how to manage a patient in septic shock. Daurin, why, what do you prepare for us? Daurin is something prepared of us. Manage a patient in septic shock. Yeah, of course. Can we start? Yeah, we'll start now. When we have a patient that needs urgent care, of course, we have to take him in, beside the COVID-19 situation or not. Okay, here's our patient, Vivian. And we will start as soon as Vivian gets comfortable with everything. This is our team. Nina will help us, Yura will help us, of course, we have everything. Okay. Ma'am, are you okay? Hello, do you hear me? Hello. Okay, she's breathing very heavily. Yura, can you please just give her oxygen? Saturation meter, okay? Okay, put this off. Let me just keep her mouth. Okay, this is okay. Yes. Can you put the saturation on? So when you see the saturation rate. So we did the A and now we did the B. The breathing is a little bit high, Dori, but it's okay. Okay, now let's go to the C. Let's put her on quick combat. Okay, she has close but not on radial artery. This one for Okay, this is great. And the COVID 19 test was negative on her, so we can do it with that protection. Okay, let's see on the monitor what is being done. Okay, she's pretty classic, she's around 120 plus. Okay, can you give her vision like B? The situation is very bad. And let's do the blood pressure, please. Okay, sure. 
She's hypothermic, so we have to put a blanket on her. Can you put a blanket, please, on her? Yes, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thrombosis, probably not now. Tamponat, probably not now. Tension, thorax, not. Okay, so set for shock. Yeah, please take blood from her. I need running, yeah. Yeah, yeah running. What's her pulse now? It's 150. Okay. And the blood pressure remains 70 or 46. So What's your saturation? Can you put it's saturation? Not on the, it's unmeasurable. Yeah. Put it on again so we'll see if it's okay. It's 84 okay. now. So it's a okay. better. Uh, when will the pre hospital team come? About two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. Okay, so we are doing everything right now for her. 
you're going to tweet the phone book if, if you will need it. Are there any relatives here? Do we know the class conditions? No. No, 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 no. Okay, so let's do the A, B, C, D, E again. Okay, okay airway is looking here. We are breathing on her behalf. Yeah. Okay, great chest is rising. Yes. Uh, C, thoughts is okay. You can also do this. Can we do Parthida. another? Yeah, please. Parathida is okay. What's her copillary refill? It's three and a half seconds. So she's in hypovolemic shock or septic shock right now. Okay. The D, okay, we said her uh, blood, uh, her sugar was 31, yeah? So it's mm -hmm. super high. Okay, we have to arrange that with medicine. And it's E, it's so wounds on there. Yes. Lila, can I ask you so you can dress the wound back on? Okay. Okay. Can you help her dress the wound? Yeah. 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 Okay, she's doing fine right now. When is the team coming? In one minute. Okay, we do the A again. Everything is here. The breathing is okay. Check the breathing nicely. Yeah. The pulse is here, so it's not fair. The doctor is coming. Okay, great. Can you start with the monitor? Okay, and we can start with simulation. Thank you, team. Okay, you. this was uh, a part of septic shock manager management. Of course, the patient has to be COVID-19 negative because we were without personal protective equipment, uh, or else she would be managed by the team that does the COVID-19 patients. Darling, we have one question. Uh, we have one question. Uh, when are take when we are taking care of endangered patient, with whom do we deal as well? Of course, when you have in primary health care, when you have a patient, you also have his relative. And this is very important, especially when talking about pediatrics. Uh, so we have to deal with them as well. And in this situation, if this was a real situation, there would be a relative with, with, with within, and I could take also sample from them. Uh, so I would know if she has any pre-medical conditions, what the drugs that she is taking and everything. And that would make it a lot easier to manage that um, situation. Okay. Because we treat patient and give them medicines, we can have a side effects. Do you agree with me, Darling? Yes, of course. So you prepare for us something else. You can go. Yeah, of course. We'll prepare something. So it's very important to master the management of anaphylactic shock once again because we treat patients and give them medicine. And when we have anaphylactic shock, we of course give this patient a medicine because of that we must master the management of anaphylactic shock when we talk about problem when we talk about uh, simulation we always talk about problematic intervention for example this intervention those that are not do, done everyone for example when we talk about anaphylactic shock we have just 50 cases on 100,000 children and you will agree with me, you cannot be competent in intervention that you do not do regularly. And you do not have the chance to learn today. If you want, if you want to learn today uh, anaphylactic shock, you don't have a patient, so you have a problem how to learn. Um, for us, it's really important this reference uh, from this author, uh, he told, that knowledge start to drop before one year has, has passed after simulation training. So what we have, today we have a knowledge after one year, we don't have 
um, we don't have any knowledge because of that we really need a simulation and we can reduce the number of mistakes by using simulation in healthcare. Please listen to me carefully. We can reduce the number of mistakes by using simulation in healthcare. Me and my team believe that and we have really great results. While learning with simulation in healthcare, Dalrin has already told us, I will repeat, we improve, we improve patient safety, better results, improving work quality, and with simulation, we improve the results. But in this moment, I want to teach someone, I want to train some, uh, someone about anaphylactic shock, but you go to a simulation with someone, but he has never seen it or experienced it. He never saw, for example, anaphylactic shock. For example, you tell a child to color the sun to be yellow, but the child does not know the color yellow and you do not have yellow color to show it to him. And results, this is the sun, okay? This is not correct answer. How to execute simulation in a better way? This is for us a really serious question. Augmented reality is the solution and we believe that we have great results between skills and simulations, we put augmented reality. For example, I have a student. Now I want to teach her how to approach a patient with anaphylactic shock. I don't have a patient with anaphylactic shock in this moment. She has never seen a patient with anaphylactic shock before. We are in an empty room, okay? I have a student, very nice student, and we are in an empty room, and we don't have a patient with anaphylactic shock. With the wake, this is simulator. Uh, we we built, uh, we we cooperate with IT uh, uh, team, and we build this awake simulator, uh, and we will create a patient with anaphylactic shock. And uh, quality training begins. When the representatives of Medical Simulation Center in Ljubljana approached us with an idea to update their framework with augmented reality, we immediately said yes. Our biggest challenge in building a wake uh, was to actually push the boundaries, the limits of augmented reality glasses um, to a degree which has not been achieved before. Our main challenge in building a wake was to push the limits of augmented reality glasses in order to create believability and the best results. At the same time, we wanted to provide the best tool set for the tutors so they can continue doing what they do best, educating medical staff and general population around medical events. What's your name? Alice. My name's Alice. Clinical simulation is becoming more and more important, but there is still a specific problem with the established approach. Utilization of rubber dolls, generic sounds, other supportive elements don't produce realistic learning experience. With augmented reality, we can produce authentic and believable clinical environment in which candidates can their knowledge almost as they could do in real situation. This means they get much better qualified to make life-saving decisions when this is the most important. At first, I wasn't able to fully imagine how the training without any clinical equipment in the room would look like. After putting on the glasses, the experience was so convincing that the only thing going through my mind was how to save the patient. While augmented reality better, better than VR and more cost-effective than real simulation, and time limitation we don't we do not have the time for prepare our candidates for simulation 
with theory and skills. We don't have time for that. And with augmented reality, we can replace theory and skills and prepare the candidates for simulation. We can prepare candidates for great simulation. Okay, so we have here Alice, who is in anaphylactic shock, and she needs our help. Alice, how do you feel? Are you all right? Uh -huh. Your body is itching. Okay, how's the breathing? Are you breathing heavily? Okay, we're going to give you some oxygen, okay? Is this better, Ellis? Okay. Что за инцидент? Я пульза, сатурация 480. Why augmented reality? If we have in a low motivation candidates, this can not happen to me. Yes, I have also that candidates. This can not happen to me with augmented reality. The candidate gets and inside this can happen to me in a real clinical environment. It, it is really important to have that knowledge. Alignmented reality to prepare managing all critical situation anywhere and any time. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, okay. I'm Alice. I'm from Liverpool. Yes, I'm on my own. Yes, I'm on my own. And before, when I will show you what I saw when I put this augmented reality in my nose. Uh, Darwin, we have any question? Yeah, we have two questions that we will talk about. Uh, the first one was, what does it mean to have problematic interventions on primary health care? Well, this is the first one. And what would this mean? Uh, problematic intervention can be the one that is not done every day. For example, if I have anaphylactic shock in a child once in three years on my shift, well, that can be a problematic intervention because I do not have enough skills to, uh, to make it happen on a good scale. So I have to repeat it, I have to learn it. And augmented reality for this example can help me real good. And the next one is, how was Awake created? Uh, as the movie to uh, told us already, it was created by CHC Ljubljana and an IT firm, Trifes, and it was uh, mutual knowledge from healthcare teams and their knowledge of software and hardware. And when we put this together, we, we have a great product called Awake that can emerge us into augmented world. What we saw when we put these glasses in nose, Doctor, nurse here. We have a patient in room 25 who has received painkillers but is not feeling well. We need your assistance immediately, please. Why am I sweating so intensely? Okay, we have a patient with anaphylactic shock. Okay, great. Yura, you're going to help me treat a patient in anaphylactic shock. Okay, okay, great. Ready? And don't forget, her name is Alice. Yes. Great. So, Yura. You have the augmented reality glasses on. Tell me, what do you see here? I see a woman, she's lying on the bed and she is completely in the rushes. Uh -huh. She has some difficulties in breathing and... What does her skin look like? It's completely in red rushes all, uh -huh. all around is the body. Is it in edema? Yeah, she is. Also yeah, edema. Yeah, also edema. Okay, can you tell me her vital functions over here? Yeah, the, the pulse is around 150 and the blood pressure is around 80 over 40. Yeah. Um, and saturation is pretty low, it's around 75. 
Uh -huh. And so, yeah, she really did an oxygen. Yeah. She told us that she uh, had an intramuscular uh, uh, injection before uh, a painkiller, and now yeah. she's feeling like yeah. this. Yeah. So, what do you think it could possibly yeah, be? It could be an anaphylactic reaction. Okay, so let's go from the beginning. Is she lying or is yeah, she she's she's lying? Saying? Yes, no, she's lying, but uh, her her um, her uh, head is uh, upper than the rest of the body. Okay, great. So she will uh, breathe easier. Yeah. yeah. What can we can we give her? We can give her an oxygen. If you okay, can you please give give her an oxygen? Yeah. Okay. Sure. How many liters per uh, oxygen? Fifteen liters. 15 liters. 15 okay, liters. great. So Fifteen liters for yeah. Ohio yeah. mass. Let's go on. What's her breathing like? Is she breathing heavily? Yeah, it's heavy breathing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's around 25 per minute, do you think? Yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's a it little is. bit fast. Yeah, it is. Okay, let's check her pulses. Let's go to the C. What's going on on circulation? Okay, yeah. What was the blood pressure? Yeah, it was super low, so I think she's going to need some fluids. Okay, so you're going to give her what? IV. Okay, give her IV and give her fluids. How much fluid for her? It's around 20 milliliters per, per kilo. kilo. And how, uh, what's her kilo like? How many uh, kilos? I think she's around 50 kilos. Yeah. Yeah. She's very fit. Yeah. yeah okay. Is. So we will give her around how much? One liter per start. start. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Can you please put it on? Yes. Sure. Just a second. Great. Okay. It's already Okay. What medicines do you, are you thinking of? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about adrenaline 0.5. Milligrams for how oh, okay. And who do you have to call so you can give it? Yeah, the doctor. Okay, great. Uh, prepare the medicine and then you can call the doctor. Okay. Can you doctor? Prepare? Yeah. Okay, the, the phone is ringing. Doctor, can you answer? Yes, please, please. please. What do we have? Yeah, we have um, an epileptic shock. Okay, hearing. first, who are you? First. Uh, yeah, I'm Yura Kaiser. I'm a registered nurse here at Community Health Center. Yura, hello. Uh, what, what do we have? We have an epileptic shock. A person around 30 years old. She, she was uh, she was given some uh, painkiller, and after that, um, she had some difficulties in breathing, a rash all around the body. She's itching, and she. Okay, has, stop. Can you tell me A, B, C, D, and E? Yeah. Um, she has a free airway, she's breathing. Okay, uh, great. Um, she had a super low saturation, about 75%, so we applied her uh, 15 liters of oxygen on a fire mask. Okay, and, and position is? Uh, it's uh, like half sitting position. Great. Yes. And see, um, we applied already um, an IV because she had uh, very low um, uh, blood pressure How was much? around 80 over 40. Okay, and pulse? And pulse was around 150. Okay, do you maybe prepare some IV? Yes. And some medicine? Ready. Yes, I prepared um, adrenaline, but not already applied. Okay, how much adrenaline you want? 0.5 uh, milligram. Okay, you will apply it now in this moment, okay. in uh, but uh, tell yes. me something about uh, how, how you will do this. Intramuscular injection in the in the thigh. Okay, muscle. great. Great. Okay, do it now. Okay, okay. please. Okay, I apply the adrenaline. Okay, what do we have to do now? We have to take a look at her uh, vital signs and have another one okay. ready okay. in about two to three minutes. Yes. You agree? Okay. Yes, I agree. What do we have to do now? Also, we have to prepare another adrenaline, adrenaline. if yeah. it will be needed. Yes. Okay, we can go to D. What will we do in D? Yeah, we can check her blood sugar. Yeah, measure it. Okay. It's 6.3. Okay, is that good or bad? No, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, okay. and what can we do in E? Yeah, we can expose her her. I mean, we just take off. Oh, okay, what do you see on her again? Tell me again what you see her. Hello, Yure. What do we have? Uh, we have a person with uh, with anaphylactic shock. Okay. Um, so shall we go to ABCD approach? Started when? It's around five, three, four minutes ago. Do you prepare any medicine, maybe? Yeah, already applied the first adrenaline. Okay. Uh, how 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 much? Zero point five milligrams. When you will uh, repeat this? Probably in let's say five minutes. Okay. Tell me something about vital signs, please. Vital signs. Uh, she has 150 uh, pulse. Uh, the, the the blood pressure is around 80 or 40. 
um, and saturation was before I applied oxygen, it was around 75% and now it's around 85%. Yure, stop. Can we go outside in this simulation? Yes, we can go. Okay, great. Okay. Gaurin, why do you need this uh, simulator? Why do you, you need, for example, in Monday, why do you need this simulation? Uh, because it can happen to all of us that we will have this intervention and we will have to react on it. And so it's very important that we know how to do this. Gaurin, do you agree with me that Awake is a successful program? Yeah, of course it is, because when we taught our teams, the results were very good with it. Uh, I already told you that uh, knowledge level, we have a great result and knowledge level of trainees from 22 to 89 percent. What do you think about this? That's a great improvement because I, of course, want to be treated by a team who has 85 percent, not 35 percent. For me, it's really important that uh, I can work with the simulation also with teams outside Ljubljana and outside in Slovenia who don't have simulation center yeah of course and Daurin, what do you think that candidate satisfaction level was 95 why why because they were emerging in the real situation because this is augmented reality they really had an insight how important it is to treat that patient and help them so they were very satisfied with it okay once again what do you see in this picture? And please, your comments on this picture. Okay. I see a trainer, I see an instructor, and I see an attendee. And you are the trainer. Yeah. And what do you want in this moment? I want to have a person in anaphylactic shock or any other urgent situations. Why? Why for this, for this nurse or for this doctor? Why? Because this can happen to her and she has to respond uh, okay so the patient can be safe. Also in primary level. Yeah, of course. Do you agree with me that better training is better care? Of course. Yes. Anna, we have any question? How was AWAKE created, Dawir? How we start? Okay, we started with AWAKE with Tsehe uh, Ljubljana, of course, and with an IT firm called Trifes. We created this product together and it was a merge of healthcare and software and hardware. We started with limitless urgent situations that can be done. How many? As much as you want. <laughs> I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> When dealing with vital and dangerous patients, we also have to manage their relatives. You agree with me? That it is important to master the skills of good communication. Mediation Center of CHC Ljubljana presents a safe place for a settling conflict since 2015. Okay, this is our mediation center. Uh, I will say hello also uh, a boss from Mediation Center, Romana. Hello, come, come sit here. Hello. Yeah. Romana, you will agree with me that conflicts are a part of our lives and we deal with them also in healthcare. You, you agree with me, yes or no? Yes, of course. Ljubljana has recognized the need for enabling a safe place for their employees in med mediation center. Uh, I will show you this picture and this is the safe place for mediation center. It's really, really important that these people who have a conflict uh, uh, can sit 
in this table and they feel that there is a safe place. Yes, it's safe and natural and they all can talk what they want to tell. Attendees come to the mediation process by free will. This is really important, free will, where a mediator will help them find a common solution. How many mediators we have in Cechatsi Ljubljana? Uh, three per year. Okay. Communication skills uh, are a foundation for creating mutual confidential relationship and are the apps tool for managing conflict. Mediation Center also act as an educational facility science 2018. Okay, you, you don't do just mediation, also you are teaching people how to deal with conflict. Yes. Okay, Mediation Center organize workshop about communication skills that are the most basic tool for successful work with people. Okay. Uh, so once again, for us, it's really important when we have a conflict, we, we don't afraid conflict, but we know that we have a safe place how to deal with this conflict. Okay. Anna, we have any question? No. No, we don't. Thought we have a lot of work with COVID-19 patients every day. Everything else related to primary healthcare is still running, including prevention. Okay. Once again, thought we have a lot of work, really a lot of work with COVID-19 patients every day. Everything else related to primary healthcare is still running in Sehatse Ljubljana, including including prevention. Prevention is really important. And we would like to show you the on the end, we really like to show you uh, the content of prevention that was designed four years ago and is called Prevention Using Simulation Healthcare or Intensive Prevention Preven Preventive Program with Simulation in Healthcare. Example, we have a patient, he gains five kilo every year, five kilo every year. He was enrolled in standard preven preventive program, results were not good, okay, why not? He gains five kilo every year, he did not understand, he did not understand the consequences because of that he was endangered for chronic disease, for example, diabetes and so on and so on. Because of that, we, in, we include in, in a new program called Intensive Preventive Program with Simulation in Healthcare. Now we will show you and what will happen. We will start with that simulator uh, you see in the picture. We will start with negative experience. After that, insight. After that, I hope that this patient will, will say, I really want to change my lifestyle. So we start in Sim Center, we start with negative experience. Darling, what we will see now in this moment. Okay, so, so here we have our patient Nina, and if she will continue with her lifestyle on, it can be a problem. So what we did for her, we took her into our preventive program so she can get an insight. We gave her a simulator of being overweight, and we will ask her to do a couple of easy interventions, and she can see how hard it is to do this when you have extra kilos on yourself. And this can be put by giving an insight to a person uh, so they can say, I don't want to live like this. Okay, Nina, can I ask you if you can do 10 squats, please? I hope so. <laughs> okay, let's try. You don't injure yourself. One, two, three, four. Great, Nina. Five, Six. Are you breathing heavily? Yes. Is it hard? Yes. Okay, four more, Nina, please. Two. <laughs> one. And now let's do another ten. 
Okay? Are you okay now? Yeah. Do you agree with me if you will continue with your lifestyle and if you will gain 20 more kilos like this, will it be a problem for you to work? Yes. Of course. Where do you work? You work in, in PR? Yes. Is it hard to work there if you have a lot of more yeah, kilos yes. on your heart? Yes. How will you do interventions if on your patient? It's very yeah. hard. Yeah. I can't read. Yeah. Let me tell you that Nina was already in, in a standard preventive program, but she did not go on with it. Why? Because she didn't have an insight on how hard it is to do those things. Nina, do you agree with me that you would try our preventive program to gain an insight and to change your lifestyle? Yes. Okay. I'm do you want to live like this? No, I won't. How will you do like this? Yeah, of course. What can be the problems of being obese? Diabetes, yes. problems with vision, okay, injuries, bad healing. So you're determined you want to change your life. Yes. Great, Nina. Thank you. For the Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Darling, we have one question. Okay. So what happened? Doreen, can you tell me what happened? First explanation. Uh, of course, Nina is not a real patient. She's she is only simulation. Of yes, course. she is our co-worker. And uh, what we gave her here with the simulator, she got an insight. What it feels like if you have 20 kilos over your standard uh, weight. So it was not easy for her. Just by doing 15 squats, it was very heavy for her on breathing and everything. Now think of it working in ER when having 20 kilos over your standard weight. It can be a problem, especially when you have to work until you're 65 or over. Okay, and so the question we, is, yeah. Are physiotherapists and nutritionists involved in supporting these programs? Uh, of course. It has to be because this is not just changing uh, uh, one routine. It has to be a change of lifestyle. So you have to change everything that you do from your routines, from your uh, nutrition, psychological health. Everything has to change. So it can be on a, on a regular basis. And it, so you can go on with it for the rest of your life or else it will be a yo-yo effect. So Darwin, once again, why we put Nina in this problem, program in simulation center? Because you have to get an insight. You have to feel the problems that can come to you. And with this, that sentence, we finish. Yeah. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, listening and watching us. Uh, it was a real pleasure from us to be able to do this. Real pleasure. Uh, I agree. Yeah, I hope uh you got some insight on the things we do how we manage the covid crisis and now we will ask didrik and give him a word if he has some final thoughts about it uh so we can complete this circle thank you from our side thank you uh colleagues from slovenia uh, that uh, that was a real uh, uh, interesting um, uh, undertaking. I mean, uh, you you really impressed me with your pace and with your uh, uh, in in inventivity. How to uh, make clear what you are doing in uh, in, in in Ljubljana Health Center. And of course, uh, uh, for some, uh, it will be new and uh, um, uh, uh, com confronting. Uh, in particularly, maybe the the, the last part. Eh? If we if we see the simulation center doing uh, prevention work, uh, uh, um, showing people or letting uh, people experiencing what are the consequences of their lifestyles. So I put a question myself: uh, How are the ethics in in that respect? Um, and uh, we might have a, a, a little talk about that. Um, we could also think about the organizational issues. Eh? There were some questions uh, uh, raised uh, in the beginning. What are the, the costs? And I think that uh, to start with that, 
um, uh, would, would you be able to, to give some uh, information on uh, the cost side of uh, uh, the simulation in center in itself, but also the aware uh, uh, option you you showed us, uh, which looks very very um, sophisticated and might uh, might not be feasible for uh, for each uh, health center. Could you could you say a word about that? Uh, thank you, Didrik. Yeah, of course. Uh, we are uh, currently updating our simulation center so we are gaining new uh, rooms and everything but everything of course that we have now will be arranged and used uh, further on uh, the costs of course there are always costs but when you think about it in this way when your employees know how to do interventions when you have a safe environment for patients that is much more cost effective then when paying for the adverse effects that happen when employees do not have sufficient knowledge so in the long run it is much cheaper to to put money in education now than to pay for everything that you have done wrong for the patient so of course it is some kind some sum of money but on the long run it's very cheap compared to adverse effects that can happen I always say with simulation center, you don't have any mistakes anymore. But if you have, we can um, um, we can try it out. Yes, yes. Because it's not just interventions. You can simulate a whole organization in a simulation center. For example, you need a new uh, approach to something. Where can you test it? Well, not in the new environment on people. You, have, you can test it in a simulation center and see if it works in real life. And then you can put it into organizational environment. For example, we have really serious document, but before when we start live or when we put this document in clinical environment, we really want to test in simulation center. And after that, we will put this document in real life. Yeah, so uh, well, that's that's interesting because there you you touch upon ethics as well of course because uh, um, uh, it, then you 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 want to prevent that you uh, you put people's life on risk uh, by in, uh, introducing new interventions new organization uh, uh, and you better do it in a simulation center because then you are in a safe environment so that's 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 in, indeed an interesting uh, uh, thinking um, Th that's the opposite what you do if you if you uh, um, uh, with the patients eh, the last option of the prevention uh, you, you put in fact patients into a situation which is uh, a very very uh, uh, negative for them and Maria Maria van der Muizenberg is is uh, giving a comment on that eh, uh, in the chat box uh, maybe Maria uh, could could you could I give you the floor eh? you, you say something about uh, uh, putting emphasis on negative aspect, aspects would be worse, uh, uh, would not be very positive, and, and you could better uh, do on the positive aspects. Can I give you the floor? Yes, thank you, Diederik. Uh, I'm glad to add something. Um, the uh, problem is that we know from, from a lot of research now that most people are not, the, the change of behavior is not so much related to cognitive functions and knowing it would be better to have less weight or something to, to not smoke or to move more but that the most uh, important influence on behavior is emotional and habits so when you want people to help to improve their um uh, the lifestyle it often does not help very much to emphasis that they are doing something not good because most people do know that they know they should uh, quit smoking they know they are too heavy they know they should eat less etc but the problem is one part motivation and um and then uh, also in another part, the possibilities to change your habits. So in uh, behavior sciences, and nowadays there's much emphasis on, um, for instance, the behavior, um, the change of behavior lenses. So you look with patients, uh, what makes it difficult for them to change and where there are um, 
possibilities in their daily life and routine where you could change a little bit because um, well that's more helpful mostly than just to say you should change it and of course patients in our consultation rooms they they always agree with us when we say you you have to uh, do you do you now understand it's important to change they say yes but that is not the same as that that really they are able to do that in their own situation so that was more or less what i meant yeah Luz is, is staying and maybe i i uh, uh unmute uh, uh Luz because you are saying Luz, uh, uh, it might be a cultural thing and then i want to give the floor back to the to the simulation center to uros and and colleagues Luz, what, what, what do you mean? Uh, well, I, uh, what I was thinking is that uh, some people and in, in different cultures, depending on how people are usually uh, addressed uh, by professionals or in other uh, ways, um, it may have the effect of a, a shock, a shock effect. Um, and that may uh, help people to change their attitude uh towards the problem that's uh, uh presenting itself so I, I can understand what maria is saying and that's what's happening in the netherlands a lot <laughs> of course to emphasize the the positive uh, aspects and to ask people um what the purpose is of the change of life if they if they want to change uh but i know of other uh people in different cultures that that's not always working in that way so um i'm interested to hear if people have a, a different opinion or if they recognize uh, the cultural aspect of it as well so that's oh, an, I can uh, see what maria is saying in the chat no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no no that's clear uh, maybe the the um the response of the simulation center Uros and, and colleagues uh, so um Lucy is suggesting you might be living in a different culture where it is more um, uh, accepted or more uh, seen as, as, as uh, useful to, to, to put some emphasis on the negative aspects of your uh, behavior. Uh, is, that, is that your experience or um, does it, it you, you told us that it works? Okay, so first of all, thank you to Maria and uh, Lois uh, for uh, their um, sharing their side of the problem. I think uh, it's not just about putting them into a negative effect. It's also about what Maria, of course, said. There are more things that come alike when doing, by changing lifestyle. What we found out that by giving someone a, also, besides everything else, a negative experience of what could happen, it changes their, their perception because suddenly, for example, I'm a 30 year old male. I am smoking, I drink a lot of alcohol, I have a family to attend to, I have to pay for my mortgage, my everything. And now if I'm put in a position where someone can say, you will get this disease, it feels like this, and I have a disease and I feel I can't breathe, I can't do the things. And now they can ask me, how will you provide for your family? because you cannot work you drink too much they took your license how will you go to work okay you get an insight not just for yourself because you're not alone in this world you all always have someone to relate to you have a family you have to take care of them so of course it is what we found out if putting them through an insight by negative effect it is okay but of course everything else has to be uh, arranged change of lifestyle different cultural um uh how would i say experiences different worlds this maybe works in slovenia but i do not know if this would work in netherlands for example every culture has its own perceptions of how things should be done so i think it's of, of course it's more just a, just an insight it's everything together that's what we think but what we found out is that by giving them a bad insight they can really relate to that and say, oh, I don't want to live like this. I don't want this to happen to me. And the program, when it was in a pilot state, it had very good results. Uh, more than half of the people really, uh, when we, we were having this program, people started changing their lifestyle 
And this program was also used for prevention of smoking. And uh, more than 50% of people uh, stopped smoking because on a regular um, programs, yeah, we all know this, what you hear goes out on the other uh, ear, okay? But when you feel a problem and you see, oh, this will happen to me, when you get an insight, it can change some functions in your brain. But of course, everything else has to come together. The environment, cultural sentences, everything. And in the end, I always ask this person, person what, do you, what do you need and what do you want? What do you want for you, for example? And after that, we start to talk about new program. We will do this, this, and this. We don't stop with, I feel really bad, but we stop with uh, how to plan to stop with smoking or something like that. Okay, thanks. That, that's an interesting answer. Maria Luisa, I, I wanted to give you the floor. Um, you, you had some concerns about uh, also the, 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 the physical aspect uh, of this, this, this patient, which has been put weight on. Um, and I, I can agree, yeah, you have to do it in a safe environment. So, could you explain a little bit more? What are your, your um, ideas about that? Hello, hi. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I mean, it was literally amazing to see how you're operating, especially in such crisis. Um, regarding the element of exercise, um, I'm a physiotherapist by profession, so uh, I, I, perhaps the technical element without wanting um, will, will be always there in my mind. With regards to exercise, I feel that when one should talk about um, a lifestyle change to uh, um, the general amount of activity that one would do, it, more, it would be a better approach to look into physical activity and patterns of daily lifestyle. And as well, um, the physiotherapists at European level and also wor worldwide are looking into implementing screening programs whereby they can actually monitor people, still not patients, but pot potential patients, in certain ways that when they come to the danger zone or pre-danger zone, we are actually would have worked um, from an anticipatory effect on the lifestyle changes. Obviously, there are the psychologists and there is the mental element of this, which has to be kept in mind. It doesn't make sense to give an exercise program and then not have a client that is compliant to it. So I feel here that the multidisciplinary approach within the preventative, the screening and the primary care approach should all be looked at like as an integrated pathway that we most probably would get from our social care models here in order to be able to address um, problems in a timely manner and also at the same time when we know that things need to be really working out nicely with our clients, which could become patients as well, we would have imprinted these small lifestyle changes as we go along. Something else that I feel about change and culture, this COVID pandemic has taught us a lot. Till about a year ago, it wasn't acceptable for us to get our temperature controlled before we get into a building, to have alcohols all over the place, to have the masks. But for some, you know, for the way it worked, we had to do it. And retroactively, we could look at the social um, elements of the social behavioral aspects of what happened in these past months um, and perhaps identify variables and models um, that we could use with our, in our clients in more of a chronic um, situation that perhaps we are not finding ways to address and be effective. This is all I wanted to say and thank you very much. It was very interesting yet again. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Luisa. That's that's a, that's a, a useful intervention as well. Um, uh, the, the interprofessional uh, uh, approach links to another question you you raised uh, uh, about the service. Uh, do you have a, a community network to support this service? Uh, it's not only so the, the interprofessional collaboration, but also the community connection um, uh, for this this simulation center. Uh, so that's that's a question to you. Uh, Euros and colleagues, um, uh, does it? Do, do you try to involve uh, the community uh, in in your uh, catchment area uh, uh, to to involve them in this simulation center and and the activities you um, you develop? 
Yeah, uh, maybe if we do not uh, talk about this earlier, what we do this by doing an insight in simulation center and by doing this preventive program, this is just the beginning. When they come here, we show them this, we take them through this process, and then if they are ready to go on, they go into a special program that is very holistic and multidisciplinary. And what you said before, by using the community, yeah, that program has a web of community that helps them one uh, and each other. Because if you do not, do not have a good community that helps you go through that change, you cannot do it alone. You need, you need a good community, good vibes. It has to be connected very good. And that is the purpose of the program when it goes on. Because when they come in simulation center, this is just the raw beginning. We just make them feel that they need a change and then the other programs take over. And they are multidisciplinary and they have a community behind them that involves and helps them reach that goal in that kind of way. And after our program, uh, for example, a nurse fr from this program uh, asked me, Uros, where we are, we will go on or we will stop with this patient, okay? Uh, we, uh, we have a good result or we have a great result, for example. Okay, we will go on. No, we will stop because he or she don't want anymore. Yeah, so you analyze things. Yeah, yeah, you, you, but that's that's on an individual level. Um, uh, the, the idea could be also uh, also mentioned by Sally earlier. Um, the community approach on population level. Uh, what are the, the 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 biggest problems in your uh, community? Uh, maybe mental health issues. Uh, do you connect to your uh, uh, population? Uh, on these questions in, in relation to the, the, the activities you've developed in the simulation center? Uh, yeah, in that kind of way, we are in touch with them, but uh, we are in touch with them through our programs that are being held by other institutions. So they are our link between them. And by talking about mental state, as we heard before, now in COVID-19 situation, this can be a real problem because we saw a huge rise in mental conditions arising from everything, from quarantine, uh, doing special procedures for people, using special laws. Uh, they cannot go outside. They are restricted, I don't know, to seven, eight people. So mental conditions do play a big role right now when talking about COVID-19 situation. So it's a lot harder now than before COVID-19 especially when communities cannot be together like they were before. I think that can be a real big problem right now in this situation. Yeah. Any urgent questions? Does somebody wants to have the floor? Please uh, uh, open up your video uh, by uh, suggesting this and then uh, you can open up your microphone. I really would be interesting to have some personal responses on on this whole presentation nobody sally please take the floor well first of all thank you so much for you know such a, a detailed and, and thorough presentation i think there's so much to absorb there but i probably haven't framed my questions very well but I think that we have such a challenge across our primary care systems about how we integrate primary care and public health and how we can try to get these kind of messages across and how we can use education simulation training to enable our primary care staff our community care staff to think about the population level of health as a whole. So while we can understand that mental health, for example, is important, how can we use the resources that we have to try to really integrate what we're doing at an individual level in primary care with the population level 
of understanding and health because this seems to me to be the most important thing that we need to do in COVID, in the COVID situation at the moment. Um, you know, people can understand the individual level, I think, much more easily than they can the kind of more epidemiological and population health level of education that we need to do. And I just wondered if you had any ideas about how we can use education and training in this way with our community level staff. If somebody else has the answer to it, uh, please, please join. Eh? Uh, I mean, uh, this is this is uh, uh, one of the most important questions indeed, uh, Sally. How do we reach uh, the community? Maria Luisa, you want to say something about it? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Hi. Um, I think that in Malta we have experienced a really interesting phenomenon during COVID outbreak. And to be honest, in such moments of crisis, probably they are the only things that we're holding on to because from a cultural perspective, our health system is primarily um, funded through government. So it's still centralized. The decentralization measures were really, really um, resisted in the past decades. We do have health centers, but the, even the approach is still centralized. Digital health was a mega no-no. The interdisciplinary displacement and outreach programs were still moving slowly. But all of a sudden, because of this need, we've seen um, uh, physiotherapists working in contact tracing centers just because they were not having their services, you know, going on really fastly and quickly. So physiotherapists who did not have a public health oriented approach have through this pandemic been trained to be looking at public health within a different perspective. I also think that the cross sectional variables in public health screening and uh, also within the political perspective of the health systems are most of the time ignored. So we have typical scenarios working in silos, situations. But public health, even the term in itself, tells you to look at variables from a public and national perspective, or sometimes even European, for example, if we're talking about rare disease. So I feel that this lack of understanding of the public health perspective, so we need to put our clinical skills a bit at the side, and look at numbers, at statistics, epidemiologies, disease trends, lifestyle trends, mortality trends as well, um, in order to be able to have this timely intervention within the different interprofessional modality. That is what I feel. Personally, I do some public health now, but initially, if I hadn't done the right training, it would have been a real difficult situation for me to understand all the numbers, the figures, the patterns within the wide scenario that public health exposes you to. Thanks, thanks. That's uh, that's interesting. Lorena, I, I just asked you: Do you have a view on this uh, as a, as a as a uh, uh, trained GP? working on, on public health issues. Are you still in uh, for uh, a small response in this uh, in this discussion, Lorena? Or are you just not? Yeah, there you are. Your microphone. Hey, yeah, now yes, okay. Wonderful, thank you for the input and a wonderful discussion. You are hitting all the points. Indeed, the training of uh, primary care providers, but not only of GPs, but all, of all others that could maybe be of, of, of help with this, um, with this uh, emergencies are very important. And um, I think here in Germany, we have the, the simulation center. So I was thinking already, are we using augmented simulation? This is really, really interesting, especially in the chain. Um, of first getting people prepared, then simulating reality, and then uh, yeah, simulating and then acting on it. Because actually the movements I was watching in the 3D are of course not the real movements. So you definitely need the sequence, but um, also for the communications, I think it's important, the discussion regarding the shock effect of uh, exposing someone to, to a to a change in 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 perception or the consequences combined maybe 
with a positive enhancer because we, we usually try here also to motivate people by positive effects or, or positive uh, reinforcement but um, maybe maybe as, as they were stating uh, the, the shock effect uh, could be could be an answer I wonder if the short shock is enough or if we would have to make it repeated sequences uh, I'm not sure of that uh, we have to see but but indeed the integration of primary care public health and the multi-professional collaborations, as has been stated, are, are crucial. And I hope we find the answer. I look forward for much more work together in the European Forum and exchange like this, discussions and, and new projects, because we are not near to the answer, especially not at the European level, based on the different uh, primary care settings and professional trainings that, that we have. But um, I think this event and um, and the work of the European Forum and each of one that are here and by being exposed to the European Forum that bring these things to their own practices and, and professional backgrounds is crucial to integrate further. So thank you for being here. I don't have answers, more questions as usual for researchers in, in GPs, but uh, some actions are despite needed. <laughs> Even if we don't have actions, uh, uh, answers, we need actions. So let's um, join in action. Thank you, Dederik, and hi to everyone. Thank you, Lorena. Um, so before ending uh, this whole session, I give the last uh, the floor to the Simulation Center, the, our Slovenian colleagues, with still the question, but you don't, you don't have to give the, 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 the ultimate answer, but how can we change the public health, uh, the, 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 the population behavior uh, in, in order to tackle the problem of COVID-19 in, in saying, well, you need to behave different? Uh, does the Simulation Center uh, uh, could could provide the simulation center uh, a help in this. Uh, well, that might be your last uh, uh, answer in this uh, session, and then we uh, we wrap up. Uh, I think. Uh, what we can to do uh, with uh, simulation? We we, we uh, prepare more competent nurse competent doctors and competent nurse and doctor will talk with population and they teach population and i think that after that everything will be okay but now first we need competent uh, teams who know what means covid how to uh, how to deal with covid not afraid covid and a um, team who are afraid can uh, came inside in simulation center. We prepare them simulation. And after that, they say, okay, everything is okay. We are prepared. This is my opinion. And Daurin? Yeah, of course. By uh, having competent uh, staff, you can put the message out. For example, when you have nurses and GPs in their general practice, they have I think in Slovenia it's about uh, one doctor has about 1,600 patients. They can reach out to all of their patients. They have to educate them. They have to live with them, and they can share that message through their offices, not just when they go to ERs or into simulation centers. Because we, in simulation center, we do not do just educations for professionals, also for lay population. That is very important link in this so we have to bring up the young ones we have to teach them how to live how to do this and general uh, practice can do a lot in that regard also when we said how do we work with our national health system by pediatricians when they have prevention for uh, middle school high school universities they can all be teaching institutions they come for for a preventive checkup or curative checkup but they can also raise our young ones and elderly so i think it's important that it's multicultural a lot of teams doing this together multidisciplinary teams and as urash said everything can be done but you have to strive for it it will not be done in one day and it's no there's no one perfect solution because in slovenia this may work in netherlands something else will work so there are more more um different results and executions that can be done. There's no right and wrong one. But when you have one solution, it's really important. For example, for my team, that we 
can test this solution before when we go outside with the solution. And for that, this our sim center is something great. So we can test, and after that, okay, it's great. Okay, this is not good idea. Okay, we must stop with that. So yeah, I think this is from us. Yeah. And thank you. Thanks a lot. That, that sounds sounds really uh, you you're you're convincing, and uh, that that that's already something we need in this uh, in this these time these these difficult times in these uh, uncertainty uh, we we have in our future. Uh, and that's that's definitely uh, a nice uh, thing to see. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for all this information and uh, suggestions and uh, 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 an overview of what you are doing in uh, Ljubljana. And I'm really, really happy that we could give you this floor, knowing that uh, normally we should have been there and uh, we should have a walk around and now going for a nice uh, dinner in uh, in Bled, uh, uh near the lake uh we 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 will we miss it and we will miss you uh, uh but this was at least uh something uh and uh, at least and, and for the content it was a lot i think we we learned a lot from you uh, so thanks a lot and um uh, thanks for everybody to join us in this uh, sunday afternoon which is normally your uh, day off um so uh i hope you enjoyed and uh, uh, hope to see you tomorrow at uh, the keynote of uh, uh, Anna Stavdal, uh, starting at 9 uh, till 9.30. Just uh, a nice starter of the day, uh, confronting you with probably some more questions around uh, future of primary care and uh, COVID-19 uh, difficulties. Um, and then hopefully in the afternoon, we see you also back for our general assembly. Thanks a lot and bye-bye. Uh, um, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.